still the best uh, that anyone has, has found in, in interpreting um, various elements of the landscape, try to mimic how humans perceive landscapes. So our approach then was to use object-based image analysis in an automated mapping project that incorporates LIDAR and other um, high resolution data sets. And because we're looking at a very broad area, the North Atlantic region, we would choose two test sites um, in very different landscapes. So we chose a, an area in Vermont and New Jersey. And then these, these areas would, would be county sized, so not entire states, but still a fairly significant area. And an added benefit is that LIDAR is often collected at, at the county level. So some constraints and priorities then before starting, we knew ahead of time that we would be trying to map potential thermal pools. Of course, the thermal pools are very complex ecological phenomena. Really the only way to identify whether a pool of depression is a functional thermal pool is to actually examine it. So we're really looking at potential pools. But in talking with stakeholders at the beginning of this project, many of them indicated that they would like as much information as possible in any type of mapping scheme. So we then chose to focus on avoiding um, omission errors, that it's easier to discount candidate depressions after we've mapped them and then try to speculate where the unmapped ones are located. So I'll very quickly describe some of the inputs then. Um, this is imagery that's probably familiar to many of you. It's, it's a, this is four band, fourth of imagery. The four band imagery has, in addition to the visible bands, the near infrared band, which is very helpful for discriminating water. So we have both leaf on and leaf off imagery, and that type of imagery is available for most places in the US. Then for the, the LIDAR, we can develop some, some very, very useful data sets. This is a digital elevation model, then, derived directly from the LIDAR, shows topography. We can also look at LIDAR intensity, which is the strength of the, the LIDAR return. LIDAR is usually collected in the near infrared, so water absorbs it, so it's good for identifying water. We can also look at surface models that are developed from the LIDAR. In this case, this is above ground features, trees basically, so we can use that in the mapping. We can calculate various flow indices, so we're looking at a uh, ephemeral water feature, so it's obviously you have some idea of how much water can potentially flow into sites. We can look at topographic indices that combine flow and, and gradients. We can also look at slopes, slope data that are derived from, from the LIDAR. And we can also bring in thematic GIS data sets. So roads and hydrology and building or you know, developed environment indices that we can use to help eliminate areas for consideration. And we can bring all of these things into e-cognition with its data fusion capabilities. So I'll just go over our, our modeling then for Addison County in, in, today, in today's presentation. So there are lots of different ways of, of automating this type of analysis, but most of them begin with identifying depressions on the landscape. So that's what we chose to do first, using the digital elevation model derived from the LIDAR. And in perhaps a, somewhat of a departure from some of the, the other published studies, we decided to then try to eliminate as many of those depressions as possible because then you, when you start mapping depressions, you realize, well, there are lots of depressions on the landscape, but not all of them are thermal pools. So we would try to look at high and low values of various indices and eliminate those that are likely to be actual pools. And then, again, trying to incorporate as much information as possible, rank the pool a comparative ranking that is based on site characteristics and, and also landscape context. So we use LIDAR for Madison County. It wasn't quite the entire county, but it also included parts of Chittenden County. So we had those three primary steps, but even before that, we had this preliminary step then exclude areas that are likely to, to um, support thermal pools. So we were able to eliminate developed features then at least in Vermont, this is an assumption that would be applicable perhaps in, in other areas, rural pools are unlikely to occur in really open areas, agricultural fields, developed areas, so we can use the surface model to eliminate areas that are devoid of tree cover. We could also look at wetlands, 
vernal pools are isolated wetland features, but most definitions of vernal pools suggest that there, there's no uh, permanent inflow or outflow. So we can do some wetlands modeling and try to eliminate uh, any features that are hydrologically connected. So after eliminating those unlikely areas, we can get to the primary steps. With the depression modeling, there are lots of different ways of, of doing it. We could have done it outside of e-cognition, but we wanted to create a self-contained model. In e-cognition, we took, this is a slope map, we could then look at areas of low slope and then grow out from those areas to identify depressions and we could run some smoothing algorithms. So the result is that for an area, we would identify these depressions, again, some of which, perhaps many of them, are not actually functional vernal pools. But this is the first step. But then the next step, we would look at outliers. One of the first things we can do is to look at hydrology. There for Vermont and many places in the country, there's pretty good hydrology data. So if, if a stream or an open water feature coincides with a depression, we could eliminate that. We could also look at some characteristics in this particular landscape, not in other, other parts of the region. A really large depression is unlikely to be a vernal pool. It's more likely to be a wetland, so we could eliminate large ones. We could look at flow characteristics, both from the, the actual depression, but also how it compares and eliminate outliers. We could also look at approximate depth. Now, it's a, a little tricky using some of these characteristics because <coughs> There's a tremendous range of variability, but we could, I did from, um, for classifying pools, we could eliminate ones that were obviously too shallow to be functional pools. So then the final classification, as I mentioned, there's such tremendous diversity in the, the physical characteristics of vernal pools that it was difficult for us to come up with a standard physical-based approach. So instead, we took a, a more prosaic approach in trying to look at the presence of water and to identify vernal pools. So here's a pool if we look at the EFOP imagery, the near infrared band, you can see that there's evidence of water in that depression. If you look at the LIDAR intensity, you can see that there's discontinuity there. If we look at both of these together then, we cannot, we cannot identify a depression that has evidence of water in spring imagery. And I should point out that the LIDAR is almost always collected in the spring as well. One other consideration was um, with, we knew that with coniferous areas we would have some problems. The LIDAR pulses sometimes do not penetrate as well through conifers as they, they do with, with, with other forest cover types. So we knew that these highly coniferous areas would pose some problems. So this was our classification scheme that we used to comparative ranking, high values, a combination of um, low near infrared and leaf off imagery, and low intensity values, a moderate class that has a, a lower threshold for, for those two, or high of one of them, and then for the, the, the low value, some evidence of near infrared, but we also incorporated some contextual um, characteristics as it clumped with, with other depressions and we did incorporate a, a depth criterion to try to eliminate seeps, which we found this, this technology picks up quite well. And then the partially conceded defeat for something that we could identify as conifers by comparing the leaf off and the reverse of the leaf on, we would assign to a separate class of steered by conifers. So this is the output then. We produce a, a study-wide area of map that would show the comparative ranking of the, of the potential vernal pools, but also show the, the juxtaposition, the context for those features with the, the other parts of the landscape. So again, trying to maximize information. So from up front, we knew that we were trying to essentially err on the side of overprediction, but we wanted to have some sense of how we were doing. So I'll very quickly describe that we did a two-part accuracy assessment compared the, the output to an existing database, a very good database for Vermont that was developed by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And then for all of the other depressions that don't coincide with that database, we would evaluate them according to our reference imagery, so the leap off imagery and the intensity. 
and look for evidence of the verbal pool. So I won't get into the nitty-gritty of that, but I'll describe that when we compare it to the, an existing database. We found that uh, initially, our initial assessment, there was, that there was 61% correspondence, which didn't please us very much, but when we took a closer look at the, the individual pools, we realized that there was no evidence of, of water in some of those, so our success rate actually was, was a more robust 91%. Then if we compare, if we looked at the, the, the rest of the vernal pools, we identified more than 2,000 <coughs> landscape depressions, and about 33% of those had some evidence of, of water. And if we eliminated the, the low class and we obscured by conifers, we'd improve that rate somewhat. So our model performed as, as expected. We captured as many known pools or suspected pools as possible, but then there, there are also a, a set of, of false positives that we, we could later discount. Just to give you a few examples then here, so here's, a, here's a, an example that was from the existing database that we did not map as a pool, and there was really no evidence for it, so there was a landscape depression, but if we look at the intensity and the, 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 the leaf off imagery, there's really no evidence of it. Conversely, this is one that we did not map, but there really was some evidence. Not a lot of evidence, but there's, there's a depression. There is evidence of it in both the, the, the leaf off imagery and lighter intensity. And then just as a, an example of a false positive, this is an area that there, there's a depression, but if you look at the lighter intensity and the, the leaf off imagery, there's really no evidence of it. And it's probably because there, there is some shadow there, or maybe it's a seed. So just to, to quickly sum then, we found that the, the LiDAR derived DEM is really essential for this type of work. There are other DEMs available, of course, 10 meter DEMs. Those really don't have a resolution for this type of mapping. For our purposes, the leaf off imagery and the LiDAR provided the best way of performing the viable classification. The current model errs toward over prediction, but of course it would be possible to strengthen the classification. We could also incorporate some more physical characteristics, which we, we had decided against for the two highest classes, but we, we could do it here. And one thing I would point out too, that most of, for our two study areas, most of the, the pools in the existing Dermal Pools databases were potential pools themselves. They had not been confirmed, so we could potentially calibrate the model of areas where there's a larger number of confirmed pools and strengthen the criteria. So, the, the rule sets that we've developed will be um, through the, the North Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative, but the, the overall goal we, we believe is an important one to produce maps that practitioners in the field can then use to, to examine in the field whether some of these depressions that occur, occur in the landscape are really functional for all the pools. And probably not a little over time, but thank you very much for your attention. Ultimately, if, if there are some practical 